one there years ago. Mm -hmm. And that same university today. Is it the same university? No, the students are different. The faculty is different. The funding structure is different. The books are different. The buildings are different. The, the, the courses are different. Right? The course offerings are different. The programs come into being and pass away, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I say Brock University, we treat, tend to treat that as something permanent. Right? If I say Oakland University or University of Michigan or University of Detroit, Mercy, University of Toronto, any of these other schools, well, University of Ottawa, well, these are constantly changing. Right? So everything is in this state of flux. So how do we come to know anything? That's the problem. The second, I come to know anything. This is a piece of chalk. It changes. Right? There's multiplicity. To know chalk in its entirety, I'd have to know each and every individual piece of this. Well, what Heraclitus claimed is that we can understand this change rationally. What goes up must come down. Right? Every action, an equal and opposite reaction. It's, it's nice not having a janitorial staff to pick this up. I think this is going to be a messy lecture. So, all right, Heraclitus, well, his general metaphysical and epistemological positions, well, he, epistemologically, he was an empiricist. He tries to sense that sense data are, is going to be what gives us accurate knowledge of the world. All right? And the evidence that his senses give us uh, give, uh, our senses give us about the metaphysical situation that we're in, if we trust them, is that everything that we see is in a state of change. There's multiplicity. Everything is in this constant state of flux. Back to the epistemology. The senses give us accurate uh, data. Right? But if we want to base a knowledge claim, it's got to endure to some extent. Well, it all makes sense through logos. It's sort of a hybrid between reason and language. Logos allows us to understand the basic rules that all of this change follows. Right? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. What goes up must come down, etc., etc., etc. So, right? that seems to make a bit of sense. Right? And Physics, for example, would explain movement, right? a lot of these general laws that a lot of this change obeys. Right? So, not a bad position. Kind of lines up with our science today. If you think, if you think about our science today, it's empirical. Right? You want to know something about anything. What you do is you set up an experiment, introduce some controls, and let it go. Watch what happens. Right. So, Heraclitus. Well, unfortunately, or rather fortunately for the history of Western philosophy, another fellow came along by the name of Parmenides. Parmenides lived between 1550 and 440 BCE or thereabouts. Right. Now, Parmenides was a rationalist. Parmenides didn't think like Heraclitus that it was their senses that give us accurate knowledge of the world. But being a rationalist is going to be the powers of reason that give us accurate knowledge of this world. Well, why would anybody question the senses in this matter? Well, here's an example. Well, it turned to, well, not to our book, because uh, hopefully you wouldn't have a book that ugly. Right? But nonetheless, a lot of classical introductory philosophy textbooks have a cheesy picture of a Parthenon on the front. Wait a second, let me get one. I'm absolutely sure I've got one here. Yeah, here we go. Can we see that? That is the Parthenon. Right? 
Now, the Parthenon was a temple to the goddess Athena. And when they were building the Parthenon, what they tried to do was make the pillars as straight as possible. Right? The idea of this building was that it would be perfect. Right? So they tried to get the measurements, the dimensions, everything just to be mathematically as perfect as possible. Only problem is, when they started putting up these very straight pillars, right, up in the Acropolis, well, the people down in the Agora got really confused about the Parthenon because the pillars, from a distance, would look bowed in in the middle. So from a distance, it didn't look perfect at all. It kind of looked stupid. Right? So in order to solve the problem, what the ancient Greeks had to do was create these sort of wowed out pillars in the middle, not as extreme as that, but nonetheless, right, to create the illusion of a straight, straight pillar right, down in the Agora, because otherwise they look bowed in in the middle there. Right? So sometimes the senses deceive us. Right? That's an optical illusion. Right? Because we know the pillars that they first put up were perfectly straight. Right? It just didn't look straight from far away. So, the senses sometimes deceive us. So that's enough reason to call question to Heraclitus' position. Right? So Parmenides decided the, the faculty that's more trustworthy than our senses is going to be reason. Right? Now let's stop, start right from basics. Right? Why is there something rather than nothing? What's all this stuff? What's the nature of this reality that we find ourselves existing in? Right. Same questions as Heraclitus. Just Parmenides put them, uh, put the question as, what is being? I'm a being, you're a being. This piece of chalk has being, this wall has being. Right. It simply means it exists. Right. I'm a human being. I'm existing as human. Right. What is this? It's being chalk. That's what it is. Right? So being is simply that which is. Sounds fairly easy, doesn't it? Right? Well, the problem is, Heraclitus went on and said, that which is not, cannot be, and can't even be spoken of. That's trouble. Why is that trouble? Well, first, what does he mean? He means that well, we can't think of nothing. Close your eyes for a moment and picture nothing. Got it? No, wait, there's something. Got it? You can't do it. Right? You can't close your eyes and picture nothing. You can't reason about nothing. Right? Well, you can say all sorts of interesting things about being. Right? This is a piece of chalk. It's this heavy. It's this long. It breaks on a chalkboard. It feels this way. You can say all sorts of things about things that exist. Right? But about nothing, all you can really say, all you can really think, all you can really know is that it's, it's not. It just isn't. Right? So rationally, nothingness is unintelligible. We can't know anything, we can't say anything, we, we can't approach the question. Right? It doesn't rationally make any sense. Problem. This is a piece of chalk, a one singular piece of chalk, just one. Now it's not. It's not what it was. Right? It was one piece of chalk, now it's not. We needed nothingness to do that. Watch this. This is not this, and neither am I. To explain how there are many sorts of things, or many things, in the world that exist, that are real, we need non-being. Mm -hmm. We need nothingness. 
in order to explain change. We need nothingness in order to explain